Okay. So thank you very much for joining. Um, I, I think we have a, uh, a great session uh, for you today. Uh, with me is uh, Jacob Solovets, if I say that correctly. And uh, Jacob, I, I think, doesn't really need an introduction, but, but in brief, I asked him last week, uh, he is higher number one in RoboFlow, uh, currently machine learning lead. So lots of depth behind the story. He, he knows a lot about computer vision, machine learning in general. Uh, and I think what struck me in his profile is, is the, uh, the uh, richness of his studies in the past, right? So he studied also philosophy, mathematics, economics, and even worked as a quant trader. So um, jack of all trades and, and with a very big spike on ML and in particular the um, uh, computer vision. So that's, um, that's for today. We have three main topics. We start with uh, a quick recap of the market. So, so what is the AI market like and, and, and specifically computer vision? Um, then the technology itself, that's the interesting part, that's where, where Jacob comes in. Uh, we have no rules, by the way, so you can ask anything you want. I'll keep track of those questions and then post them to Jacob at the right time. Uh, if they fit in the story, then, then I, I will do it there and otherwise it will come at the end. And of course, there's a last section where it's just purely Q&A, right? So first market, then technology, uh, and then Q&A. Let's start with a, a simple question to get a sense of, uh, of you guys in the, in the room. Um, how much do you know about computer vision? So we can tailor the story a bit to your needs. I'll, I'll give you a, a poll right here on your screen. So it's coming up right now, where one means um, absolutely nothing and 10 means a lot. Uh, I know Jacob also has invited some people, so, so maybe we're screwed a bit to the right, but it's good to get a sense of where you guys are located. I'm getting a sort of like a uniform distribution on my on my screen, which which makes it pretty hard for you, Jacob, to uh, to tailor the story. Okay, a couple more people. Yeah, seventy five percent. Still in the question. Okay, I think we're we're good there because the results will not change drastically. Um, let me end the poll and, and share the results with everybody. I think there is a, um, let's say, a, sort of a, a, a big chunk in the middle. So a lot of people claim they know something about it. And there's also some people who are a bit more confident in, in the five to seven range. Uh, there's no one here that, that says nine or 10. There's also no one who's that, that said one. OK, but this is the distribution we have to work with. Thanks for that. And, and maybe another quick question before we really dive in. Where are you from? And if, if you can share that on the chat, then we, we know a bit like uh, what the regions are that are, are dialing in. I, I know for sure it is uh, some in the Middle East, some in the US and, and some here in the Western Europe. Okay, um, let's start with the, the deep dive into the market, right? And, and this is to give you a better sense of, of how this is actually um, relevant nowadays in the world of work and in the world of automation. So the first important thing to know is, is the general, um, let me see if I can make this smaller, a general perception of how large the added value of AI is as a technology. And, and I think this is a classic McKinsey chart. Uh, it's a couple of years old. The essence here is that AI as a technology brings 13 to 15 trillion US dollars to global GDP, right? So what does that mean? What is a trillion? Well, that means that is a lot of value, right? The global GDP in total per year is roughly 80 trillion. So adding such an amount, 13 to 15 trillion is, is a very sub substantive chunk of GDP. Um, of course, this is over eight decades, right? So we, we're not going to um, add 25% to GDP in one year, but this it's, it's a huge case. And it doesn't happen so often that you have one technology where you have such an incredible uh, uptick in GDP based on the potential of that technology alone. If you look closely at the, um, at the slide, you'll see that there's, there's two big chunks, the purple chunk here, and the, the dark gray chunk. Uh, and those are the two main chunks of where the value is. And I think in, in simple terms, you could say this, this purple chunk is everything that relates to customers, right? It's knowing customers better, uh, customer service, uh, recommender systems that recommend things to customers, pricing uh, AI, promotion AI, uh, customer acquisition and lead generation. So everything that has to deal with the, uh, the, the customer side of things. On the other side, the, the dark gray area is sort of the opposite side of the, the value chain. This is where uh, things are produced, right? So this is predictive maintenance, um, 
automated manufacturing, yield optimization, um, this kind of stuff. So those are the two big chunks in terms of value generation. We'll see in a bit how computer vision uh, fits in to some of those. The question I think globally is, is this uh, value, is that spread evenly, right? So do all countries and all regions benefit in the same amounts? Uh, with a fear that that may not be the case. And I think that fear uh, seems justified. If you look at the projections, who is benefiting the most? Um, the projection there is China will benefit the most, then the US, and then all the other regions will, will come behind that. And I think there's a lot of deeper questions on why is this the case? Is this purely the speed of innovation or is this partly due to regulations, for example, in workforce um, uh, laws and regulations there? Uh, data pooling, right? uh, national uh, safety, national security kind of rules. So at the moment, uh, it looks like China and, and the US will benefit most from this trend and Western Europe where we're located a bit less. And if you do that same analysis per sector, you see also that there is a couple of sectors that really benefit uh, with manufacturing uh, clearly in the lead. Yeah, this is a question and maybe put it on, uh, on, the, on the chat. So if you think about computer vision, right? So within the AI space, of course, there's more than just computer vision. There's a lot of other um, uh, strings that you could dive in, for example, natural language. But what is the use case of computer vision that you're familiar with, that you know about? Uh, and maybe put it in the chat. I'll, I'll see what you guys I see. A lot of people from California. I see from Chile, from Switzerland, Singapore. Uh, use cases, self-driving vehicles, object detection. Yeah, I think those are... Does seem correct. Nice to see so many people from a lot of different places. Italy, Spain, Canada. Wow, Louis Vienna, Minnesota, UK, Amsterdam, Italy. People counting and profiling, facial recognition, motion capture. Uh, someone calling from Greece. Okay, perfect, right? So I, I think there's quite some people that, that at least have an idea what this technology is about. I think the most famous one, at least the, the answer I was expecting and, and it came up uh, is this case, right? So facial recognition, uh, you, if you have an iPhone uh, or a Samsung that is already built in, uh, it's becoming more normal in the building actually where we're located, the whole building is, is uh, has facial recognition, right? So we don't have keys or anything like that. You can just walk through if, um, if the system recognizes you as, a, uh, as an entrant. So this is a classic use case. It is also a use case, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure Jakob will, will say more about, but in terms of business value, yes, this is growing very rapidly, but in terms of uh, the perception, um, the ethics, this is also quite a challenging one, right? So when is this allowed? Um, if it, is it allowed for law enforcement, uh, for immigration? Or well, quite some people say, yes, that seems reasonable. Is it allowed in school, mm, you know, to, to, to track if, if students are actually uh concentrated and focused and give feedback to teachers and um, may maybe not is it allowed in retail well there you see a chart here at the bottom uh percentage of consumers who would avoid a store if it was using facial recognition to identify them uh, and that percentage seems pretty high so there's at least let's say more than half of people that don't think this should be done in retail but maybe in some other places and that's more justifiable and then of course there's the question who is doing this is that a private firm uh, or is that the government and, and which one of those would you trust more, right? So there's there's quite some interesting dynamics here, not just in the regulation, um, but also in the technology behind it. And that's uh, the intersection between the two. In reality, it's not just uh, facial recognition. There's a lot of different areas where this plays a role, right? So you can see, for example, automotive is quite big. Uh, autonomous driving, of course, facial recognition. Also, postal and logistics, recognizing numbers, et cetera, on envelopes. So it is quite evenly spread across a lot of different uh, sectors and industries. I think in reality, and this is my last slide to Jacob, then I'll hand over to you. So then, then the market part is done. Uh, I think this is a very interesting slide. It looks a bit complex, but the story is pretty simple. So how far have we actually come in embedding this technology in the actual um, uh, factories and, and, and manufacturing plants that we have? And I think... You see percentages on this graph. So this is the percentage of the technology actually embedded in the actual systems. An estimate of that uh, combined from McKinsey and Stanford. I think the story there is not so much, right? It's between 10 and 30%. Uh, so yes, it's there, but there is a lot of room uh, to grow, a lot of places where we can still improve and automate. 
um, which of course is good news for RoboFlow, but this is the current status quo. And to give you a sense of how that might look like, I, I have a brief video and I would like you to watch the video with a sense of, hey, where does this computer vision technology come into play? So everything where it relates to perception, to object detection or to error detection, uh, defect detection, like these kind of things, um, I think that can happen in a wide variety of cases. So let me give you a sense uh, to sort of give you a richer experience of how that will look like in the future. Okay, and with that, I hope you were ident identifying a couple of the use cases of this technology everywhere where you need perception, uh, object detection, defect detection uh, in such a value chain. I think there's a lot of use cases. So let's hear from Jacob. Uh, Jacob, I'll make you uh, the undisputed host now. So I think you can control everything from here on. If not, let me know and then, uh, then I'll fix it. Here you go. Awesome. Hey everybody. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining us and Renz, thanks for the awesome intro on, on the computer vision market. i um, excited to dive in here um, on some uh, kind of some hands-on use cases. And then we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper after that into uh, computer vision technology and, and data sets. And we'll even talk a little bit about um, how you can get started on a project and kind of how, uh, how you can actually get out and uh, start actually chasing this uh, 13 or 15, 15 trillion dollar number that uh, that we that we've been uh, tasked with by the, uh, the McKinsey analysis. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here and we can dive into some use cases. Um, so Renz was pointing out um, just how vast the influence uh, computer vision is going to have on the economy at large. And I think sometimes that's um, it's kind of easy to zoom out and when you think about that, you, you, you kind of see numbers on charts and you think about it affecting the economy, but it's interesting to actually look and see the exact kind of projects and the exact sorts of areas where um, computer vision is influencing things. And certainly the, the cases that we see at RoboFlow um, are uh, numerous. Um, and there, there is certainly a concentration of cases in some of the traditional uh, areas that you would see um, computer vision making a big impact in, like manufacturing and uh, automated uh, detection of, of error analysis and some of these things where things are more repeatable. Um, from a machine learning practitioner standpoint, I see those problems as being more solvable because the, um, the way that the patterns of the data are, are being shown to uh, the machine learning models is a little bit more replicatable. So if you imagine we were looking at the, the Tesla Gigafactory, and you could see in that plant, you know, there's a lot of processes that are reoccurring time and time again. And they might be, you know, machine parts might be slightly off balance, uh, but for the most part, they're gonna be, data is gonna be drawn from a relatively stationary distribution. And so that's a really important thing for machine learning models is some sort of stationary distribution where they can learn how to model because we don't have a general AI yet that's able to solve all of these things. And so that's kind of another point that I, I want to bring up here with this 
um, millions of, of, of use cases for computer vision is that computer vision is not being deployed in industry today as a broad solution by um, just a few small actors. Rather, it's uh, computer vision solutions that are tarot, tailored into narrow AI domain areas via small data sets, small narrow, narrow domain data sets, where there's an expert, perhaps like yourself, where you know an industry very well, or you know a certain part of, of a business that you know very well, and you know how to find the data inside of that particular space. Um, and then those narrow AIs are being constructed then deployed um, into, into businesses. And so here looking at this slide, um, we, we, have, we just write here a few uh, examples and I'll, I'll take a couple of these apart so we can kind of think about the way that um, people are using these. But there's the traditional use cases of like facial, uh, facial recognition, self-driving cars. These are really the, the kind of the big high flying um, you know, use cases that, that most people know about. But I think a lot, of th a lot of these use cases, people don't know this is going on, but people are solving all of these issues um, currently with uh, tools like RoboFlow, but uh, all sorts of other computer vision tools as well. Um, so some of these are like plant versus weed detection. People are kind of analyzing the health of their fields um, by, by looking at plants. Um, people are measuring fish. Um, so this is one of my favorite uh, use cases that I've worked on where um, there's people who, who are doing uh, commercial fishing in New Zealand and they have a lot of commercial fishing ships and when they throw down their nets below the ship to pull up fish, um, they, they have fish finders so they know that there's fish below there, but they don't know what species of fish it is. So often they'll pull up the nets and pull up fish that are out of season. And uh, then they have to uh, release all those fish, but most of them actually die in the process of being released. So instead of just having a, a basic uh, fish finder below the boat, they now have computer vision cameras that are identifying the species of fish. And so they can send that data back up to the ship and identify which species of fish they're, they're uh, catching before they pull up the net so they don't have to kill as many. So not only is their, their fishing process more uh, more efficient, but also it's it's more environmentally sound. And so I think that's um, that one in particular is a really good example of how computer vision isn't necessarily replacing jobs, but rather it's enabling new technologies. And so when we think about those large multi-trillion dollar numbers that are, are that the economy is going to be seeing as an impact of this technology, I think that's really the way to think about it, which isn't so much, I mean, there is some automation. So Maybe some factory floor workers will be automated automated away by the technology, but more so we'll be seeing use cases where we'll be tackling tasks in the economy that we've we've never been able to, to tackle before. Um, yeah, so a few more, few more use cases here. There's one, a hard hat detection, where you could imagine you could be doing kind of like safety monitoring. monitoring. That, that one's kind of reminiscent of, of facial recognition. Um, and then there's all kinds of other super fun things like, uh, We've had users on, on our platform doing a sushi identification, just kind of like for, for, for fun. And, and people, uh, one, one user made like a lucky charm detector where he could uh, tell the different pieces of cereal that were in his, uh, his cereal bowl. Um, so those are a few, uh, few of the wide ranging use cases. And hopefully this kind of got your mind uh, spinning a little bit. Um, it certainly gets mind spinning every, every morning when I wake up and work on this stuff. Um, and we'll go ahead and head to the next slide here. So if you think about uh, the computer vision pipeline, um, so this is true, this, is, this, this pipeline is true for um, all um, machine learning pipelines, but in, in computer vision, we'll kind of hone in on a uh, particular, um, oh, it looks like someone raised their hand. Um, yeah, uh, game to take questions at any point during this talk. Um, Renz, do you know if we can, we can field that? Yeah, uh, so I don't know who it was, but but uh, and I don't see the question right now. But but if you were the person raising the question, type it in the in the chat, or or type um, or, or click on the Q and A, and I'll keep track. And and Jacob, uh, if it, if the time is right, I'll uh, interrupt you uh, to post the question. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. But of course, want to hear hear all of your guys' uh, questions as we as we're going along. Um, yeah. So this is this is kind of the computer vision uh, workflow, which is um, very replicatable across any task. Uh, any of those use cases that I mentioned will all kind of follow the same uh, set pipeline. And, and you, can, you can iterate on any one of these pieces. 
Um, so the first piece uh, is to collect data. So you want to be collecting a representative data set. Um, and then after you've collected a representative data set, you move along and you organize it. So you maybe you're kind of uh, deciding which part of the task you want to tackle and you're, you're organizing your data. And then um, you next are la labeling your data. So this is where you're drawing annotations and you're informing the, the computer vision model of what it should be detecting, what it should be classifying, how it should be analyzing the images that you've, you've been providing it. After that, you, you've processed your data set. So this is where you take all those labeled images and you put those into um, a, a data set to, to get ready for training. So this might be you're moving some images into your training set where you're showing your network, some into the validation set where you're evaluating how your network is doing on your data set. Um, or you might be also doing like image augmentations or image pre-processing steps. And these are steps that um, you can do to kind of like slightly change the, the shape and size of your images and the way they appear. So you can kind of be um, leverage, like building a larger training set from your, your base training set. So that's a processing step. And then you can go into training, which is where you're, you'll actually be showing uh, your images to a neural network and then kind of training the neural network to be able to uh, recognize the labels that you provided it. Uh, after that, once you have a model trained, the next step is to deploy it. And so this is a step that um, is often uh, underlooked by, say, uh, academic uh, side of computer vision, where they usually stop at training, where they get some good analysis and they publish a paper. But then if you actually want to take this model out and put it into the real world, this is a deploy step. Um, and this is where you're putting the model um, into onto some sort of compute environment where it's available for, for inference. So now it can actually make those predictions um, in real life. And uh, often, often the case in computer vision, which is different than uh, the natural language processing world for deployment, is that people are increasingly taking uh, these models and putting them onto edge devices. Um, I don't know if I have a device at my desk this morning, but these are usually little small, um, you know, GPUs or small TPUs or small VPU uh, devices um, where you can get, get um, a very small piece of hardware um, onto the edge and be running inference very fast. Because a lot of times in computer vision, you need a real time, real time detection speeds, um, which requires, um, you know, either a, a very small network or, you know, big hardware and, and usually the hardware is limited. So, there's there's that that trade off on that side of things, and then after that, there's... can I ask you uh, two questions? Uh, two questions popped up. I'll do them in the reverse order. I, okay. I think the last um, lo local processing, um, what you mentioned, someone is asking. Nick is asking like Nvidia Jetson, right? And I think that is correct. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Nick. Yeah, the Nvidia Jetson is one of the most popular uh, edge devices. They're extremely hard to get a hold of right now. I actually was on the phone with uh, Nvidia a couple of weeks ago. And uh, they said they said they uh, um, they said they would try to give us priority in getting Jetsons, but that that meant like five months from now. So yeah, so great question. Yeah. Are there any alternatives? Um, yes, uh, one of our favorites at uh, RoboFlow is the Oak device. Uh, this is made by a company called uh, Lexanus, um, and it's a small. Uh, camera that has a VPU uh, in the back, which uh, a VPU is the Intel's version of uh, of, of a GPU, basically. Um, and uh, I think they're like a hundred bucks. Uh, very popular, and, and we really like the the Oaks. Oh uh, yeah, the Raspberry Pi. Um, so you can use a Raspberry Pi, but remember that it just has a CPU on it, so you're going to need to have a very very small and extremely lean uh, neural network. Uh, to to use to use one of those, but it, it it does count as an edge device, and I've seen people headed that way. And and there was one question earlier: What, in your mind, is the state of the art in OCR? Oh yeah, uh, so that that's a good question. Um, so if you want to pay for it, uh, there's an OCR solution called uh, Lead Auto, um, which uh, I I have paid for, and it's extremely good. Uh, if you don't want to pay for it, um, there's one called um, I think it's PPOCR, which is made by um, Baidu. So Baidu has this machine learning framework called um, uh, Paddle Paddle. So that's where the PP comes from. And they recently uh, released this open source um, 
PPO OCR, and it's 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 fascinatingly good. So I'm actually using that now myself. Uh, oh yeah, you uh, <laughs> want a link for this one? Yeah, we, we can send some links maybe afterwards, uh, Jacob. So so you're not. Uh... Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> and talking at the same time. Well, uh, Felix, we'll, we'll get you the links uh, after the workshop. Okay. Yep. And you can use Tesseract too. Um, but that, that one's, I, I think some of these newer ones are a little better now. Okay. Good to go. Yep. Um, okay. So yeah, continuing on on this slide, the last step is display. And so th this is the, the, the part, I don't know, we, we lumped this all into one little spot here called display, but this is actually where I think the most amount of the work actually goes on with these applications is that you actually have to build an application around the neural network that you've trained. So this means um, you're going to be visualizing uh, the way that the model is predicting and you're going to be integrating it into some larger application. And so a lot of the work that is actually done in deploying computer vision into industry today is actually just the same old software engineering. And so that's kind of one, one of the aspects that we've really taken to heart at RoboFlow, which is to empower developers to bring computer vision out into the world. Um, that means making it easy to use, making it interoperable, um, and making it so you can, you can put it in, into any application that you want to. Um, and so I think that's a really important thing to remember when you embark on one of these projects is, um, yes, there are some uh, machine learning teams like that are really deep in, in, in modeling and, and are um, you know, just fully living and breathing in computer vision land uh, all day, day in, day out, like maybe like a Tesla machine learning team or something. Um, but there's a lot of teams that are a lot more horizontal than that, that are using this, where um, they're, they're integrating it into web applications or they're integrating it into their, um, into their you know, different, different company um, applications. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, next part of this talk, we're gonna dive into a little bit more uh, in depth on uh, what uh, modeling is like in computer vision and uh, due to the um, uh, wide distribution in the beginning of, of people's different experience with computer vision, I'll try to uh, both go deep and shallow at the same time, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, but I guess I've got a poll for everybody first, which is, um, have you ever built a machine learning model before? Um, yes or no? And the questions can just appear on the on the chat. So I think I think we're seeing 60, 70 percent yes. So you have an, you have an educated crowd. <clears throat> Okay, awesome, awesome. I saw one one response there that you used yellow v4, yellow v5 with RoboFlow. That's awesome. Um, friends, for a little context there, we um, we often produce tutorials on how to uh, how to train different state of the art neural networks as they as they get released. Because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's sometimes it's not so intuitive, so so tutorials are are necessary. And um, you're getting a compliment, by the way, uh, from, from uh, Jacob uh, Stadelhuber. Uh, oh. So, so the, your company's like, so that is, uh, that's great halfway during the session, I think. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks. Jacob. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, moving, moving on then. Um, so the, like, like I said, the first part of this, this process that we would be embarking on, let's say, um, I guess for, for fun today, I wanna imagine that we're, we're making a, a blood cell counter. So let's say we have a bunch of microscopic, microscopic imagery, and uh, we want to try to develop some technology on how to automatically count the number of blood cells in, in, in a blood sample. Um, so we might have images like this, where we have different red blood cells, uh, white blood cells, and platelets. And um, so the way we'd go about tackling this is we need to gather all these images and start labeling them. Um, and uh, so you can see here that we have the different labels for the red blood cells and the white blood cells. Um, and we'd be gathering a large data set uh, of those all together. So I'll zoom out here and we could look at this data set. So this is a data set that's on, um, on RoboFlow, but you can find these kind of data sets um, all over online, but we have a bunch of them collected here at universe.roboflow.com. Uh, the idea being there that maybe people can start collecting uh, similar data sets and, and working together on them without having to reinvent the wheel every time they uh, tackle a new task. 
Um, for example, like we've seen maybe like 10 or 15 people, uh, separate different initiatives working on pill counting. Um, but, you know, maybe there's kind of one spot where everybody can rally around uh, making, making pill counters. Uh, but yeah, so here's an example of kind of where these, this data has been labeled. Um, and you can do this uh, labeling tools. There's, there's a lot of different computer vision labeling tools. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the data set's being gathered and then it's being split into these train test splits. So these are the, this is the set that we'd be showing the network. This is the set that we'd be evaluating our network's performance on. And then the testing set is the set of images where we, we it's kind of like the final boss where we'll, we'll do our final tests on that, but, but you don't want to peek, on it, peek at it too much because you want to be predominantly iterating on against your validation set so you don't overfit your testing set it, it is the idea there. Um, and then going on to the next slide. This is, so now we'll, we'll go into a little bit of like network architecture and the way that uh, the network uh, works. Um, and so here we, we so a, a really popular example in uh, computer vision is this MNIST data set, which is kind of like, uh, you could think of it as sort of like a landmark data set in computer vision where people were, were starting to realize how how possible the, the technology um, was, was how many different things it'd be able to solve, which was in the beginning, it was just recognizing digits. So it was like digits zero through nine. Can we classify those into uh, the right bucket on looking at the image? So when, it, when an image gets processed, it, it gets split up into these pic, image pixels um, that you can see here. Um, and that's really all the, the computer sees is an array of height by width, um, and then uh, three, three channels for um, RGB. Um, and sometimes the, uh, you can do grayscale, so you just actually just only have one channel there. Um, but this is really all the data uh, that the network is, is going to be able to have to be able to classify this um, as an eight. And this is kind of a weird eight, right? Because it's got this, it's got this like a uh, little edge shooting off to the right here. Um, but so what happens is this, these pixels get fed into uh, neural network layers um, where they, the data is combined uh, via matrix multiplication and, and um, linear algebra mathematics uh, to, to, to get to form uh, image features. And then those image features are, are kind of passed along uh, throughout different levels of the network. And as they're getting um, more granular or less granular, um, they're, they're kind of getting fed into to different uh, pieces of the network. So I've got a couple of demos that I want us to look at. Look at and um, uh, one of these I think is fairly mind blowing, which I, I found when I was uh, looking at these the other day. Uh, I gotta move this. Well, so we'll start with this one. Uh, so this one is, is uh, visualizing how a convolutional neural network works in uh, MNIST. Um, so this is, uh, you, you could think about this as after the neural network has been trained. So this is after it's already um, sort of learned to identify features from uh, the, the, the images that it's looking at. Uh, but you start with the base image here. And then as you move along, you move along through steps of the neural network and start to form different uh, levels of features. So from this seven, now we'll be looking kind of like at different dimensions of the seven at different levels of abstraction. Um, and the way that this is visualizing is this is visualizing like the, the activation weight of different pixels. Um, but you can see here that it's getting transformed and there's, there's some point uh, here where, you know, in the beginning human intuition is like, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's looking at the pixels of the seven. And then there's some point here where it just kind of, you just kind of have to trust, <laughs> trust the math um, and it starts to form uh, different features that makes it easier. But the important thing to see that it's doing is that it's transforming this original image into different features, which eventually could compress down into the prediction layer, which here is, um, is, uh, is, is, the, is the class, the class list here. Um, so you can see that it lit up around seven but it also had some likelihood of maybe being three and maybe being eight, but definitely not six, definitely not five. Um, so that's uh, kind of a little bit of, little bit of a visualization. Obviously 
um, there's there's like a lot of math behind this and a lot of code that you can keep going uh, deeper down into. But I just kind of wanted to uh, zoom out and and show you something like this and in, in uh, for the purpose of our talk today. Another one that's in our slides that I, I really like uh, to show on this is uh, this uh, MNIST demo by uh, Carpathy. So Carpathy is the um, head of machine learning at uh, Tesla. And uh, he's he was really before his time. So he published this in 2016, which is an example of running neural networks in your browser and in JavaScript. Um, and uh, so at this demo, you can see he set some set some hyperparameters for the way the neural network is training. But so even live on my screen right now, we could we could refresh it, and, and Carpathy is going to kick off this training again. Uh, but it's iterating through the MNIST data set uh, with this data set of digits, and it's computing our loss metrics. So as you're training your network, you'll see your you'll see the loss going down, which means that. Um, your, your network is getting a better feel for the data that it's modeling. So you can see here that the loss is already going down. So it's getting a good idea of what, uh, what the different digits are. Um, so you can play around with this kind of stuff. Um, if you want to redefine the network a little bit, you can use his, uh, use his JavaScript library. But the other thing cool that's cool here is we're seeing how it's, it's starting to learn how to model these different digits. So you see these activation gradients, which is the same thing we were looking at on the other screen. Um, but you can see these are um, starting to get uh, more focused in around the pixels that they should be they should be fixing on. Um, then the other thing you can see here that he he does, which is pretty nice, is he puts out the test set for MNIST and shows you where uh, the the confusions are. So this one um, for predictions on the test set three uh, often gets categorized as three, but sometimes two and sometimes five. So um, same thing for this one where that that three, uh, we lost it, but that three was often getting incorrectly uh, categorized as seven. And, and it did it often look like a seven, but the, the, the point I'm getting at here is that the, the networks aren't perfect um, and they are um, uh, prone to error, especially in cases where um, things might programmatically trick them into, into thinking uh, the wrong prediction. Um, so it's really it's really important to have a very clean and um, robust uh, data set uh, when you're when you're building these models. Um, okay, now I'll jump back into the presentation. So that was a little bit on deep learning, um, and then one uh, kind of parting thought that I want to leave us with in, until we get into Q and A and maybe kind of more freeform discussion for for the rest of the talk is. Um, uh, that this whole process uh, that I laid out for the machine learning pipeline is uh, something that you actually should think about as as uh, as making a lot of passes through. So as you're starting to work on your projects and, and deploying this into real life, or um, if you're working with developers who are um, uh, doing this in real life, see you, Morgan. Have a great class. Um, is that this is a continuous circle. So you'll be going around the circle many times. So you'll first start with collecting and you can iterate on that, then organizing, then labeling, training and deploying. And then you'll get into deploy the deployment environment and you'll find that there's some little pieces that you wanna edit. So for example, we have a, a customer working on pill counting. And so they, they are identifying counting pills from above. Um, but now they notice that if someone brings their fingernail, if they, if they painted their fingernails, um, you know, maybe they have like red painting on their fingernails. Those are starting to get identified as pills. So they should introduce examples of that data, of that null data into their data set and then go back through the, go back through the, the pipeline again. Um, so this is a process called active learning. And I think it's um, one of uh, a very important thing to think about as you're building your pipeline for the first time, because um, it, like coming from a AI research background, it really, in the first time you go through, it really feels like you're just kind of getting all these wires connected together and it kind of becomes a little bit of a rat's nest, at least if you're, if you code like I do. Um, and, uh, but, but thinking about trying to make that into a more streamlined process, you can go around uh, time and a time and again to make your, your network really better and then uh, make it into a, a production environment that uh, is going to satisfy all of your, your business needs, all of your customers' needs. Um, and all of the needs of the 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 um, domain you're tackling. Of course, this looks a little different if you're just 
getting a feel for things and you want to try things out for the first time. Um, and you can um, you can just kind of go through once and, and get a feel for it. Um, but uh, that that's sort of a, a parting thought. And um, now uh, now we'll I guess open up to questions and any other topics that uh, Renz would yeah. like us to, to talk talk about. Thanks, Jacob, for 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 the talk. Uh... I, I think we have uh, one question to start with from from uh, Jacob uh, Sattelhuber, um, and, and that is that can you deep dive into that organize step of this last uh, this last circle that you showed, and then uh, for everybody else, um, I think we'll just do as many questions as as are actually there. So feel free to ask. If you run out of questions, that's the end of the session, and uh, so anything is allowed. But maybe start with the the organize uh, step. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so organize. Um, step was uh, the step where you have your data set and you've labeled it. And now you want to break that data set out into pieces uh, for uh, while you're training. So the, the pieces are the training set, which is the one you'll be showing the neural network to learn from. And then the validation set, which is where you're kind of evaluating your process as you go along. And then the testing set, which is the final boss. Um, and then the, the thing about the, the sets is that you can perform different steps on them. So there's a, a pre-processing step uh, which goes across all three sets. And this is uh, something like resize, where maybe you want to resize all your images uh, to 416. So when you get to the deployment environment, uh, you can infer at a smaller image size, or maybe you want to do 224, so 224 pixels, that is. Um, so that's pre-processing, which happens across all three steps. And then there's augmentation, which just happens on the training set, where you can do things like you can take the image and rotate it, or you could uh, do something maybe where you do like a crop where you zoom in and out. Um, or there's all kinds of different image augmentations, but this is where you're uh, manipulating your data set to create um, basically more examples and more images for it, for it to learn from. So those are all uh, things that we consider to be in the organized step. Uh, obviously, there, there's a lot more there. Maybe you like, maybe you wanted to say, like, say you're making a self driving car neural network and you say, well, no, actually, in this pass, I really just want to work on. Um, foggy images. So I'm just going to do, uh, I'm going to organize my data for this training and just like limit it just to foggy images, or I'm just going to limit it to like desert uh, or, or maybe a particular city or, or something. Um, but what organize is kind of a broad, broad term that we use to, to encompass a lot of different things. I think there are, there are a couple more. Uh, let, let, me, let me go through them uh, one by one. I, I think uh, it's a bit of a general question and uh, but the question is from Florian, where do you get high quality data sets? Uh, any, any tips? Yeah, uh, definitely. So um, uh, tooting my own horn, but there's that universe.roboflow.com where we're saying to collect uh, more and more uh, data sets and, and uh, public, uh, public data sets that people are working on out in the open. Um, but there's um, a lot of good data in uh, the open images uh, data set, which is an image of some Millions amount uh, that uh, is already labeled uh, by I think I think it was a Google project, um, and then there's Coco, um, which is a Microsoft Coco uh, project, which has uh, is kind of like the, the gold standard uh, data set. Um, that, so those are all good if you're if you're just kind of playing around with the technology and want to start to learn how to model things. Uh, but if you want to put uh, something in production and actually do it. You've got to gather data from your deployment environment. We we kind of see this problem all the time where someone say like wants to make like a, a chicken detector or like to count chickens at, in their in their yard, um, but they'll take like pictures of chickens from Google Images and then try to train a network on that and then deploy it into their real life environment. And the the fact of the matter is is that uh, the machine learning tools we have today just aren't that. Uh, they're, they aren't that smart, um, so they, they get confused when you try to train them in one environment and, and bring them into another. So I highly recommend sourcing your own imagery, um, though I know that that can be tedious, but that's it's part of the part, part of the problem that a lot of AI scientists are working on these days. Great. Uh, from uh, Srini Fasu, uh, the, the question is, um, and maybe it's good to read it yourself, it, it's a bit of a longer question, but um, in your example of fingernail wrongly detected as spill after adding a new sample, we have to run training train for the whole data set. Uh, is that correct? Uh, how can we avoid huge costs and time? Uh, for example, only train on incremental uh, data. 
Oh, that, that that's a great question. Uh, something I definitely think about uh, every day. Um, but the the fact that, as you pointed out, it is correct that um, you do have to rerun training for your entire data set in the current state. Uh, the reason being is there's this um, uh, there's this uh, effect in in AI science today called catastrophic forgetting. Um, there's a few papers on it if you want to like dive in further. But let's say you have a data set of 85% of your images and you run training and you have your, your network weights uh, saved there. And then you go and you introduce the next 15% of your data set and um, you don't want to run training on everything. So you just run it on the 15%. The network will then kind of forget. It won't totally forget, but it will mostly forget uh, the other 85% that you showed it and it will zoom in on the 15%. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so uh, GPU costs uh, as a result are are through the roof, and um, that, that's just kind of kind of the nature of the game. But as as compute is getting more and more uh, efficient, uh, some of those problems are solved. But I'm sure there will be some cool science coming out on that on that topic. Um, and I'll be staying tuned. And if if you find stuff like that, I'd love love to love to hear it too. Good. I, I think we can keep going forever. There's a long list of questions for you, Jacob. But but the, uh, <laughs> let's go with um, uh, Smriti. Um, sometimes grayscaling gives bad accuracy, um, and I think the question is how to how to make that better. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, grayscaling um, can can diminish accuracy because just like you know you're you're taking the data that you're providing the network and you're you're cutting it in in one third. Um, uh, but there, there are sometimes cases where grayscaling can be, uh, can be useful actually on the other side of things. Um, like we could imagine if we have a data set of hard hats and all of them are yellow, except like a few of them are, are, um, green or something, but the network, the network might overfit into the yellow and, uh, miss the green one. So you can just grayscale and kind of even out the, the playing field that way. But, um, other than that, I, I guess I don't have any particular, particularly insightful tips um, on how to tackle grayscaling. Okay, okay. Um, then there's the question, what's the best two-dimensional, uh, 2D human pose estimation open source? Oh. Um, and, and specifically for complex poses. <laughs> we'll leave open what, 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 what those are, but yeah, that's the question. That's a good one. Um, I would use uh, alpha pose. Um, and then if you're willing to pay for it, uh, wrench. Uh, but I think wrench maybe went out of business. Um, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll write those in the chat. Alpha pose. It's um, done by some uh, AI scientists in at a university in, um, in China. Um, it's really good. Okay, great. Uh, last few, is augmentation needed with YOLO version five? Uh, so yeah, uh, oh, good question. Um, so this is one that we often get a little, little bit of a trap. We get, we get uh, stuck in our overflow sometimes. So augmentation. Uh, so there's, there's two, there's two different forms of augmentation. Um, there's one uh, offline, which is what happens at RoboFlow, where your images get augmented offline, um, where it happens to your whole data set and it's kind of crystallized in time. Um, and then there's one form of augmentation which happens online as you're iterating through your data set during training. You can also be making augmentations as um, as the the neural network is making passes through, um, and YOLO v five does online augmentation uh, as well. So if you augment in RoboFlow and then you train in YOLO v five, you're augmenting in both spots, and so that seems a little redundant. Uh, Glenn, the author of YOLO v five, thinks that we're kind of ridiculous for doing doubling up on that, uh, but I've seen a lot of empirical results that it does work. So um, I would say augment away. Great. Uh, Paolo is asking, is the, in the pill counter, are the fingernails labeled or annotated as false positives in the CNN? Uh, yeah, right. So you would, you would probably, uh, the, that, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, so you would probably, that there's a couple different approaches you can take. So the first approach you can take um, is to label the fingernails um, and to call them like fingernail or some separate class. Um, but if you only have a very few amount of images, this might kind of get uh, missed along the way. Uh, or a few fingernail examples, they might just get totally missed. Um, and so you could just leave them in there as unannotated null null data. Um, 
I think this is one where you actually have to probably do both experiments. So you maybe label them and then you you can drop that class um, and try both experiments um, and kind of see which one uh, works better for you. But that, that, that's a good point. I, I'd say that's that's where the science becomes a little bit of an art. Uh, how to handle noise in data sets. Uh, for example, if 15% of the data set is noise, uh, do we remove the bad images or show these to the model as well? Uh, I, I, I always remove bad images. Um, certainly if you have noise, uh, unless, it's, unless it's noise that you would expect in the deployment environment, um, I would always try to, uh, try to fully, uh, fully eliminate it. Okay. Um, is there a good age classification model? Uh, that, that's one that uh, maybe you're like, I, I actually don't know. Um, uh, you, you got me on that one. <laughs> it, it's very sensitive. We, 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 we tried to build it once with users to, uh, once they logged into chemo, that there would be an age classifier uh, oh, cool. and a lot of other classifiers in, in, the, uh, in the same stream. But the age uh, was definitely the most sensitive point. So I, I, I think there's a lot of people that take that number very seriously that uh, that comes out. Um, <laughs> Hauk is asking, how would you go about sorting complex groups? course to complex or the other way around? Okay, um, this is a good one. Um, so I think I, I think the way I'm interpreting this is um, maybe you have a use case where, um, let's say you're making like a car detector, you could detect the different types of cars, uh, as well as just the car class in general, um, with the different types of cars being the more coarse um, definition. Um, and I usually would recommend labeling uh, to the most coarse degree um, that you feel comfortable with labeling. And it takes more time, obviously, but uh, to label the most coarse degree, and then you can always merge uh, back up in, in levels of complexity as you, as you go through with your, your experiments. Um, hopefully I interpreted that right, but I'm, I might have I missed. Okay, then, then the last three, right? And I think also in respect of your time, because we're, we're uh, almost at the end. Um, is YOLO V5 smart enough if the data is uh, red, red, green, blue, or grayscaled, or is there a setting? Hmm. Um, I, I, I know you can uh, provide grayscaled images to it. Um, I don't know if there's like a particular flag that you should put in there to inform it that there's a single channel. I think there is. Um, and uh, if I was going to tackle that question myself, I'd go to the YOLO V5 issues and search uh, for grayscale and Glenn's probably got some really great stuff uh, for you there. A similar question to before, uh, for the existing model with two outputs, if you want to add an, uh, a third class, uh, we have to train the model again for all classes. Is that correct? Yes, yes, that's true. So say that's, that's kind of the same thing um, as what we were talking about before with the 85%, 15% uh, new data is, yeah, it, the model's a little brittle, so it's going to, um, you're gonna to need to start and and add the add the third class. But the the thing you probably should do here is when you start for your to, on your three class trading, is to start from the same weights uh, that you finished with uh, with the the two class uh, training, and that that will just make training run a little bit faster. Um, okay. Oh yeah, that was that was a topic I didn't bring up on on the other question on this, which is that uh, yes, the compute is uh, expensive to go all the way back through your data set. Uh, but if you start from a checkpoint that is the the previous training run, uh, the network will uh, learn a lot faster because it's already uh, learned how to form those features like we're seeing with the the digits. Jacob, last last question from my side uh, to, to sort of zoom out again, right? So we we took a good deep dive, I think, into a lot of specific things. Uh, zooming out in 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 uh, economic use cases, is there is there any use case? Um, maybe a bit hidden to the public where being in a RoboFlow, you see a lot of value and, and it's, it's not so obvious as facial recognition or autonomous vehicles. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, I think, I think the, the McKinsey studies were pretty uh, on point with talking about uh, kind of manufacturing and, and a lot of those use cases being the, the initial ones. Um, and uh, that, that's things that are happening in, in factory floors. Um, for example, like uh, drywall, you could be identifying how robust a, a drywall is being formed in a factory plant um, just by using machine vision. Um, and so I think that's kind of the first wave, but 
as we as we went through with all those use cases like sushi detectors and things like that, I think there's going to be all kinds of uh, fantastical uh, use cases, both in in a real world automation and industry, as well as like augmented reality and and a lot of other other areas. So it's it's certainly uh, an exciting time to be getting involved in in computer vision. Um, if you tuned into this talk, hopefully this this inspired you a little bit to to start looking into it a little bit more and um, Certainly enjoyed being here, and then th this was really awesome. Great, thanks, Jacob. I, I think that's uh, that's the end. So, uh, thanks so much for for, for joining. Uh, thank you for presenting. Uh, we will send the the slides. We will send a couple of additional links because uh, there was quite some people asking for those. Uh, they should be with you in, in the next ten minutes. Um, thanks for joining, J Jacob. If you log out, then automatically the recording is stored, and um, I'll, I'll get to you over email. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye, bye.